and we are live. Hello everybody, welcome back. I am Paul Ducklin from Naked Security at Sophos. As usual, if you can hear me, just give me a I can hear you note so that I know it's all working correctly. I think I set up everything correctly in advance today. So let's crack straight on with the new story that we, we're going to be talking about today. It might not be the most significant or the most important story from a cybersecurity point of view, but it's certainly one that has attracted an enormous amount of attention, and you probably know what it is. Uh, if the title didn't give it away, uh, let me show you what the story is that started this. This is a warning from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, together with the FBI and essentially the US Department of Health. And this is what they published. I hope you can see that. It has the unattractive name AA20, that's as in 20, alert for 2020-302A, I think it's the 302nd alert version A, but it's the title that we really need to pay attention to. Ransomware activity targeting the healthcare and public health sector. So basically, the, the idea is that the, the, the FBI feel that they, I, I guess from, they haven't said, they don't need to reveal their sources, Word on the underground is that ransomware attacks against hospitals and healthcare, particularly in the US, that the crooks have been pursuing quite aggressively this year because they know that hospitals, they can't afford to shut down. They're quite big. They've got access to public funds. So if they're really stuck, maybe they can get squeezed out of the money. So the evidence is that the crooks, at least some of the crooks, are planning to continue. Now, we could have assumed that because what we generally see with cybercrime is what works yesterday for the crooks and gets them large amounts of ill-gotten gains is probably what they're going to try tomorrow. And if it still works tomorrow, then they'll evolve it and try the day after and the day after and so on. So it's not news that the healthcare is, industry is under attack. All this report was was a warning that says, if you are in healthcare, here are some things you should really read now. Because and they go into the detail of how one particular common uh, ransomware attack involving the TrickBot malware and the Riot ransomware, that's just one example. They give you a detailed expose of how the attack unfolds, which is an excellent example. Even if what you get isn't TrickBot plus Riot, it could be some other combination of malware. The crooks could get in via some other means, such as a weak password. The battle story that the, that the CISA report tells is informative, even if it's not the one that you might face in the future. It gives you a good idea of what you're dealing with. So the reason that I wanted to cover the issue, well, what to do, there's this healthcare warning. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of coverage that we've seen in the media has very much focused on the, wow, healthcare in danger. And the it's almost as though the implication is that this is a criticism of and a little bit of a dig at the healthcare industry for not being good enough, whereas in fact it's simply a warning that happens to focus in this case on the healthcare sector. And it, I think it's led to some people go, oh well, what a relief. I'm not pleased that they're going after hospitals. I'm not pleased that they're going after healthcare, particularly in this coronavirus era, but at least it means I'm okay. Either, obviously, I'm not at risk because I'm better at cybersecurity than the average hospital, or the crooks have taken their eyes off me for a little bit so I can relax and get myself in order and, you know, let's hope the hospitals get their act together. What I advise you to do, if you haven't read this report, uh, go and have a look at it. And wherever, now there are some things in there, admittedly, that are specific to healthcare. So there are cybersecurity interest groups that are healthcare specific, and there are some there's some regulatory stuff that's very specific to the healthcare industry. As you can imagine, if you want to try out some random new firmware on your home router or on your Android unlocked Android phone, that's your business. But in a hospital, you're not allowed to go around reflashing firmware on things like ventilators anesthetic machines and so forth. Even if there are known problems with the firmware, you have to kind of learn to live with those because the risk that the machine might go wrong is considered to outweigh the risks that you might accidentally connect it somewhere and get it hacked. So there are some things that are cyber security, uh, that are healthcare specific in that report. But what I'd urge you to do is read it and wherever you see the word healthcare or health sector or public health, 
Imagine in your mind that those words are crossed out and your own industry sector is written in there, whether that's retail or hospitality or aerospace or civil engineering, what legal advice, financial services, realty, whatever it might be. Just imagine that your industry sector was written in there and imagine what would happen to you and your business if you were to get hit by the kind of attack that is exemplified in this in that report. So in order to indicate why ransomware is a somewhat changed problem from perhaps what it was a year ago, let's just quickly revisit where we've come from and where it looks like at least the big time crooks are going. And then we'll get back to what the medium time and little time crooks are doing as well. So the most important thing is we do a very potted history of ransomware. 2013, we had CryptoLocker. Those guys spammed out massive numbers of of attachments. They aimed to infect tens or hundreds of thousands of people at a time and to take $300 off each and every one of them individually. They had the infrastructure and the service to do that. That was very labor intensive and quite complicated and it took time to get their business going. So a new wave of crooks came along. He said, let's up the ante. Let's go for hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands if we can computers at the same time. But instead of having 10,000 different people each giving us 300 bucks, let's go for a company. Let's paralyze their whole network. Let's go looking for their servers as well. So they don't just have a few laptops that have locked up and they can go and get some old ones out of the cupboard and live through it. Let's, let's mash their servers and their, let's bring their whole business to a, a, a halt. Then we can ask them for much more money. And that's exemplified 2017, 2018. There was a, a, a cybercrime gang uh, out of Iran, I believe, called Sam Sam. And they went for about 50,000. They wanted $50,000 at a time. We don't know why they, it was almost always that the amount of Bitcoin they selected with each attack was just below 50 grand, maybe 49,000, 48,000. We have no idea why. All I can suspect is that they figured that there was some kind of accounting trigger in many US companies that if it was under 50 grand you didn't have to go to the board or IT could self-approve it and it was easier to get the money together and they went after victim after victim after victim thousands of computers at a time and asking for five digit ransoms and sadly getting them until the FBI identified them and uh, put them on the wanted list and they kind of went quiet. But Unfortunately, the crooks now, the modern day ransomware crooks, believe it or not, they are up to eight digit ransoms. And I'm not kidding there. That, that sounds dramatic. Now, eight digits, that's 10 to the power eight. So I'm, I'm talking, actually it's not, it's 10 to the power seven, isn't it? <laughs> because of the one at the front. $10 million. That's the highest ransom I've heard of asked. That was CWT. It's a US travel company. They would, the, the extortion demand was $10 million. Apparently, they were able to negotiate it down. My golly, what a lovely bunch of chaps the crooks are. To a mere $4.5 million paid in order to get their business back on the rails. Now, that's a joke because it was a travel company, right? Um, but it was very true. Their business was completely dislodged. Um, and the problem is that the reason the crooks have got such big money in mind now, not just the 50 grand that the Samsung guys had two or three years ago, but they're going for millions of dollars at a time, is that their, their MO, their modus operandi, has changed a bit. So instead of getting into your network, scrambling your computers and say, right, here's the extortion demand, here's the blackmail, pay us the money or we'll eat the copy of the decryption key and you'll never get your data back. These days, the crooks take a kind of wider, deeper, much more evil view of the system. So let's look at what a, how an average ransomware attack unfolds these days. It might take, it probably won't take hours. Typically it might take days or weeks that the crooks, once they're in your network, by whatever means it is, they will take their time. And if you go to nakedsecurity.sophos.com, we've got an article that that details these stages and goes through the history of ransomware, just as I have, just to give you an idea of, if you need to explain it to someone else, why it's not quite like what it was a year or two years ago. Um, here are the nine stages that I've identified. Now, there may be many more, but he here are typically nine things that the crook will do, the crooks will do. Once they're into the network, they need one password, one beachhead, one malware infected computer, one computer that they can get into and issue some commands. And then step one is they will take their time to map out your network. So they will know your network 
the nooks and crannies of it, how many laptops you've got, how many servers you've got, how many overseas offices you've got, how many remote workers you've got. They will know what your network look, work looks like by the time they come to unleash the data scrambling part pretty much as well as you do. In fact, if you haven't been careful about inventory on your network, they might even know your, they might even know your network better than you do. The second thing they will do, typically quite early on, is they will, as they're mapping your network, is they will figure out, because it's not that hard, where your so-called trophy data is. So that's things like email backups, it's things like business plans, financial statements, personally identifiable information relating to customers, stuff that they know is absolutely covered by regulations like GDPR in Europe or HIPAA in the, in the United States, where they know that if that data gets out, you are going to be in serious trouble with the regulator. And then they will set about stealing that data. Doesn't matter how long, they'll just upload it to a cloud service somewhere under a temporary account, for example. Upload that data while they carry on with the rest of their stuff, including they will go out of their way to make themselves into sysadmins. So they will either dig through files looking for passwords, guess passwords, use password cracking tools, um, or if there are unpatched computers on your network, they might be able to use exploits, what are called uh, elevation of privilege exploits. Essentially, they want to get themselves into the position they are at least equal to your own IT team and your own sysadmins. So basically, whatever you can do on your network to manage the whole thing, they get into the position they can do that first. They will typically also create new accounts on your network quietly, guest accounts, alternative admin accounts, and they'll create passwords that only they know. And what they're, what they're banking on is that that means if you do notice and they do happen to get kicked out, early on in there today, then they'll be able to get back in tomorrow and basically carry on where they left off. So they'll give you a false hope. You catch them, you kick them out, but they've left the back door open so they can sneak in. Typically, you will also notice that they will install, they, they may not, but typically you will notice that they will bring with them or they will download or they will find on your network hacking and penetration testing tools that may be the very tools that your own red team or security operations center or IT guys use day to day, either for administering the network, for validating passwords, for looking for security holes so they can close them. And if the crooks know that you use some of those tools, they will use the same tools that you do because they're banking on the fact that if they show up in security reports, it's possible that someone will go, wow, that looks a bit suspicious, a password cracking tool. But I know the IT guys use that because they like to keep an eye on things. So they, this is called living off the land. They try and blend in by not bringing their own hacking tools, but using ones that may be, even though they can be used for evil, they're also commonly and regularly used for good. So they try and kind of fit in with the sort of things that you're already doing. Typically, once they're sysadmins, they will find out what security software you have. And if they can, they will go in and they will manipulate, they will reconfigure your security settings, whether that's tweaking things on your firewall, dialing down your web filtering a bit, changing your antivirus settings, adding exclusions so that they know that when they bring their malware along, they can put it in one particular innocent looking directory and you won't notice because you've kind of given that part of your network a free pass because you kind of think no one from outside the network will ever notice, but the crooks are inside your network and they're going looking for that sort of information. You will also typically notice a few malware infections popping up, malware detection springing up here and there that kind of look inconsequential. And typically what is happening when the crooks are doing this is that they're deliberately running various malware samples or using particular techniques for loading things into memory, installing files on disk, enumerating processes, killing off tasks that they need to deal with. They're trying stuff out to notice which ones trip your alarms and which ones don't. And what that means is if you're in the habit of looking at your malware reports and going, oh, look, we had a malware report or we had a, some weird hacking tool. It got detected and removed. Great. That means the problem solved. Ten years ago, it probably did. 
Unfortunately today, what it's very likely to mean is that if, if you can't tie it down to your own system administrators doing this, what it may very well mean is that someone is probing very, very slightly, hoping they will make just enough noise that you will go, hey, aren't I great? I found the problem and I fixed it. In fact, all they're doing is they're, they're finding out the nature of, mapping out the nature of your defenses. The eighth thing that they will typically do, and this is extremely important to remember, is in mapping out your network and finding your trophy data, they are very, very, very keen on locating any online backup servers or services or upload systems that you have. So for example, if you've got a cloud backup system, they might just reprogram it so it's uploading your data to them instead of you. So you're not getting, a, they're then stealing your data kind of automatically and you're not getting your backups. And typically, once they know where your online backup services are and how they work, they know that they can go in and trash your backups just before they do the very last stage. So remember, we're talking about ransomware, but we've had eight terrible sounding things that have happened before stage nine, which is they unleash the ransomware, scramble all the files. They've got access to all your computers because they're sysadmins, remember. They know what security software you use, so they've dialed it into a way that they know it'll give some alerts, but won't. It'll, so you won't notice it's not working properly, probably, but it's just weak enough to let them do their stuff. They've trashed your backups, and they've already, rather than just scrambling your data, they've stolen your data first. So now they get a kind of double play. Maybe that, that's probably the wrong analogy. To, like a double whammy against you. So when they come to give that ransomware demand, A, they've typically scrambled all your files so they brought your, your clients and your servers, your laptops and your servers and your services to a screaming halt. So in the short term, your business is in real difficulty because you're finding it hard to operate. So step one of the blackmail is they say, pay us the money and we will give you the decryption keys, and that means that you will get back up and running much more quickly than otherwise, because as you will see, we trashed all your backups. And then the flip side of that, if you say, well, I've, I've got an offline backup, which you should have, if you've got an offline backup, then the second part of the blackmail, the extortion is, well, by the way, let us show you some files that we stole from your systems. Imagine what happens if those were to reach your competitors, your customers, the stock exchange regulator, um, the, the salacious parts of the media, or the regulators who look after data protection, HIPAA and GDPR and so forth. So they've now got two ways of, of extorting you. So those are the warnings for healthcare because obviously in a hospital, which is, they're typically very busy, they're 24 operations, they often don't have quite the budget or the time they want to put into IT. They have particular challenges of their own. But all those nine steps that I've mentioned, that's typically what's happening to large, medium and small businesses when ransomware crooks get inside these days. They're not trying to get 10 computers for $2,000 each, that'll be 20 grand. They're trying to get a thousand computers and hundreds or thousands of really, really salacious and important files out of your network. And then you'll find the blackmail is going to be more like $100,000 or $1 million. And in some cases, companies kind of feel like, even though it's doing a deal with the devil, they kind of have very little choice but to pay. Otherwise, they're going to be putting their customers at risk and they're just not going to be able to carry on with the business. So what are the things you can do about it? Let me rush very quickly through some tips that you can do at home and at work and of course both because these days when you're at home, that laptop you've got at home that you use for home and for work, it's probably visible on the corporate network. If IT can help you look after it, then any crooks who've given themselves sysadmin powers on the corporate network can miss look after your computer at the same time. So tip number one, don't ignore reports of malware infections that seem to appear and then go away that might be signs that somebody is doing an experiment. Tip number two, don't overlook reports of hacking tools. So typical examples, let me read you some out. Network scanners like Nmap, perfectly legitimate tool, but if you don't normally expect to see it on your network or there are computers where you wouldn't expect to find it because only the penetration testing or the IT security guys use it, if you see reports of things like Nmap, Angry IP, Advanced Port Scanner, uh, tools like Mimikatz, which is a, a thing that tries to sniff passwords out of memory, a lot of penetration testers and red teamers 
in, legitimately use that tool to, to see whether security is as good as it should be. And other password cracking tools that try and guess what people's passwords are. They want to see if you've chosen a weak password so they can get you to fix it. But of course, the crooks want to find out if you've got a weak password so that they can abuse it. Um, and there are a bunch of other tools, notably uh, the Windows Sys internals tools. Fantastic suite of tools. Every Sys admin will have them in their tool bag somewhere. The crooks love to bring those along. That's tools like PS Exec, Process Explorer, um, TCP View, tools like that that show them what's going on on the network. And the reason the crooks love those is that even though they can be used for bad, they're very often used for good and they're the kind of tools that you might expect on your network. So if you see reports that you were not expecting and you cannot tie back to one of your own sysadmins, be very concerned because it could mean that there's an attack poised to happen on your network. The crook, you, you don't know how close the crooks are, assume that it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Also, you need to review your remote access uh, carefully, pick proper passwords, and use two-factor authentication when we can. There's a when you can. There's a there's a story um, that's broken in the in in the news in Europe today about a, 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 a Scandinavian company. Well, they do do a bit of cybersecurity, but they're more of a physical security. Parent. I won't mention the name of the company, but they apparently they had a ransomware attack. The crook stole some data. Good on them, they said, we refuse to pay, and the crooks had gone and dumped a whole load of customer data in order to embarrass them. And, but the most embarrassing thing, uh, this is only an allegation, but it seems to have come out in the story, it seems that the reason the crooks get in, and sometimes I like to brag about how bad the security was, it seems that they had a remote access password, which was password 01. I'm sure they didn't intend that. I'm sure it just forgotten, got forgotten on an account that they that they that they hadn't looked at for ages. So it's not a bad that that's a bad enough look all on its own. Uh, the other main way, or perhaps the major way, that crooks get a beachhead in your network, of course, is through phishing. And so the last two tips are use some kind of phishing testing system. I'm not saying that because we have Sophos Fish Threat. Do go and have a look at that. But it's a, you need something that's a great way where your IT people can test out users, see if they're likely to fall for fishes when it's someone decent on the other end who can counsel them rather than a crook who's trying to get one and only one person to make a mistake that gives them that little beachhead that they need to bring in all those system hacking tools. And lastly, I've said this before, and I do want to say it again. If you're in the IT team, make sure you've got a good, reliable, easy to remember, if you like, security 911 hotline, whether it's a phone number or an internal email address or both, where users who think they've seen something wrong can easily, quietly, and without any drama or complexity report it. They may be wrong a lot of the time. There may be emails that look like fishies but aren't. But as I've said before, if crooks are targeting your network to get one beachhead to build up to a $1 million ransomware attack, they don't send one email to one person, and if that person doesn't open the attachment, go, okay, well, we'll give up and we'll move on. They'll try everybody, and so if one person says something to somebody, then that may mean that everybody ends up getting protected. So if the first person who sees something says something, that can be exactly what you need to keep the crooks out of your network. So that's all for today, folks. Um, I'll, I'll let you get on with preparing your systems to be resilient against the crooks. But the main reason for today's video was just to remind you that even though the news is full of, wow, healthcare under attack, the crooks are ramping it up on healthcare, that doesn't mean that healthcare's loss is your inadvertent or good fortune gain. So it doesn't mean the rest of us can stand down from Red Alert. It means there are things that the FBI and the CISA are hoping that the healthcare industry will do that maybe some of them haven't done before. But the lessons they're trying to teach to the healthcare industry are the very same lessons that we can learn from and implement ourselves. So thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, stay secure.